Welcome back to our study of the fundamentals of operating systems based on the textbook Operating System Concepts, 10th uh, edition by Silbershots, Gagne, and Galvin. Well, we're going to start on a brand new topic this time. We're going to start on... What the heck are we going to start on? Uh, memory management. This is a good one, so let's get rolling. I assume by this point that everyone knows that the operating system does not work directly from secondary storage as its processing instructions. It uses primary storage, or main memory as it's often called, to temporarily hold instructions and data as it processes. So to work, the operating system must first bring instructions from secondary storage into primary storage for processing. You'll recall from a previous lesson that we said that a computer program is a passive entity, a file that's stored on the disk. It's not until it is loaded into memory that it becomes an active entity, and it is referred to as a process instead of a file or a program. As it is being loaded, it is necessary to decompose that process into smaller units, as we've already discussed. And we talked about how this, the units were sized, possibly using the sector of a disk as a size. In any event, the process is decomposed into smaller units. And each of these units is given a logical address by the CPU. They may be units that start off at zero and go on up to whatever number of units are necessary to hold the entire process. However, when the process is actually stored in address spaces in RAM, these address spaces have their own physical addresses. And these logical addresses have to be translated into physical addresses at that time. When the process is running, it knows nothing about physical addresses. It is calling up instructions using the logical addresses that were created by the CPU. It's necessary for those logical addresses to be translated into physical addresses in order to retrieve them from the memory location. In this lesson, we're going to learn how this translation takes place. We're also going to learn how the operating system is able to protect its own memory addresses from interference by user programs and how it is able to protect a user program's memory addresses from intrusion by some other user program. Primary storage is a piece or pieces of hardware known as random access memory or RAM. Now, a characteristic of RAM is that it is very fast. It's electronic speeds. Nothing's moving, just electrical signals are passed from one spot to another. But it is also volatile. That is to say, it has to have power. When the power goes away, whatever's at RAM goes away also. Secondary storage, on the other hand, is a semi-permanent storage location, such as a magnetic disk drive, solid-state drive, or magnetic tape. Essentially, this is where everything goes when we have finished processing and shut the computer down. When I say semi-permanent, I mean that data is kept there whether there's power or not until you decide to remove it. In an earlier unit, you and I discussed how the CPU can be shared by a set of processes. Because of CPU scheduling, we can improve both the utilization of the CPU and the speed of the computer's response to its users. To get this increase in performance, we must keep a lot of processes in memory. In other words, we must share memory between processes. In this unit, we'll discuss various ways to manage that memory. The memory management algorithms vary from a very primitive approach to a strategy that uses paging that we'll be talking about later. Each approach has its advantages and disadvantages, as we will soon find out. 
Selection of a memory management method for a specific system depends on a lot of factors, including the hardware design of the system. As we shall see, most algorithms require hardware support, leading many systems to have closely integrated the hardware and the memory management component of the operating system. After all, we did determine that the operating system is the resource manager of the computer and the hardware is a resource. Memory consists of a large array of bytes, each with its own address. So we can see that the locations in RAM where the data and the instructions are stored are addressable. The CPU fetches instructions from memory according to the value of the program counter. The program counter, also referred to as an instruction register, holds a pointer to a memory address containing the instruction. Now this is a component of the CPU itself and the instruction register. These instructions may cause additional loading from and storing to specific memory addresses. A typical instruction execution cycle, for example, first fetches an instruction from memory. The instruction is then decoded and may cause operands to also be fetched from memory. These operands are temporarily stored in registers within the CPU where the processing takes place. By the way, the instruction that was loaded into memory also brings the address of the next instruction that will be needed. That's what's loaded into the instruction register when the previous instruction was loaded. After the instruction has been executed on the operands, results may be stored back in memory. The memory unit, that addressable location, sees only a stream of memory addresses. It does not know how they are generated by the program counter, indexing, indirection, literal addresses, and so on, or whether they are instructions or data. Accordingly, we can ignore how a program generates a memory address. We are interested only in the sequence of memory addresses generated by the running program. We begin our discussion by covering several issues that are pertinent to managing memory. The basic hardware, for example. The binding of symbolic or virtual memory addresses to the actual physical addresses and the distinction between logical and physical addresses. So this is going to be a good one, folks. Main memory and the registers built into each processing core are the only general purpose storage that the CPU can access directly. The CPU cannot access the secondary storage directly. It has data transferred to main memory by some other handler. As I said, those secondary storage locations are not used for processing, although as we will see, it may be necessary to retrieve other instructions from secondary storage during processing. There are machine instructions that take memory addresses as arguments, but none that take disk addresses. Therefore, any instructions in execution and any data being used by the instructions must be in main memory or in the CPU registers. If the data are not in memory, they must be moved there before the CPU can operate on them. Remember that requirement. Registers that are built into each CPU core are generally accessible within one cycle of the CPU clock. The short story is that it's much faster to process from registers than it is from main memory. Some CPU cores also decode instructions and perform simple operations on register contents at the rate of one or more operations per clock tick. The same can't be said of main memory, which is accessed via a transaction on the memory bus. Have you ever looked at a PC motherboard? You can see that the CPU is plugged onto the board in one place while RAM is connected at another. Obviously, it is quicker to process something located in a register within the CPU 
than it is to transfer those instructions and data across the motherboard between RAM and CPU. Completing a memory access may take many cycles of the CPU clock. In such cases, the processor normally needs to stall since it doesn't have the data required to complete the instruction that's executing. However, this situation is unacceptable because of the frequency of memory accesses. The remedy is to add fast memory, a cache, between the CPU and main memory, which is typically on the CPU chip for fast access. To manage a cache built into the CPU, the hardware automatically speeds up memory access without any operating system control. Okay, I think this is a good place for us to stop. Take a few minutes, go over the, your notes, update your study guide, and when you're ready, come on back and we will start talking about how the memory manager is able to separate the memory space held by each process in memory.